Adam Schiff and I found our way to San Jose. I'm Brad Palmer and we're at the California Democratic Party Convention and I'm so glad that Mr. Schiff is joining us. He is a member of the U.S. Congress. He is the ranking member on the House Intelligence Committee and that's why I wanted to speak with you about this controversy swirling around right now with regard to an iPhone. And it's the iPhone that was that was owned by the perpetrators of the tragedy in San Bernardino on December 2nd. Um, the government would like Apple to help them unlock the iPhone, and Apple is reticent to do that. They believe that would set up a scenario whereby all phones could be unlocked by the government. You as a lawyer, as a, a ranking member on intelligence, what do you make of it? Well, interestingly, and there's a, a, another wrinkle to this, which is the phone was used by Farouk, the male shooter, but it was actually owned by the county of San Bernardino. Oh, and wow. they have asked Apple for help in opening the phone. So they have supported the FBI's application. It's a difficult... Well, that, that, well as, as a former lawyer, I guess I, I'm always a lawyer, that really does seem like a, a, a special wrinkle. I mean, if it's owned by the county, then couldn't the county just say, yes, open it? And I, are they not saying that? Well, the county is supporting the FBI's application. Right. But I think, actually, as a legal matter, it may not be all that consequential oh, really? in the legal analysis. But as a public policy matter, when people think about privacy, uh, it doesn't have an impact on people's perception of this, that right. the owner of the phone is saying, yes, please help open this phone. Okay. But the, the, the challenge is this. Um, this is probably among the most compelling facts for the Bureau in any case to open a phone. Uh, but there are probably hundreds and thousands of these cases around the country where prosecutors have phones they have seized as evidence, they have gone to court, they have a warrant to open the phone, uh, and they haven't been able to get the phone open. So it has much broader ramifications than just this one case. That's why I think Apple is fighting this. They're concerned about the press then it would set. Ultimately, I think uh, this is an issue where the industry, privacy stakeholders, law enforcement, the intelligence community, the Congress administration, uh, we need to sit down and hammer out some kind of a compromise where in these very significant cases, we can get access to the information uh, that we need to protect the country. At the same time, uh, we don't set up such a broad precedent uh, that it, it poses too unacceptable a risk either to privacy here or uh, opens the door for China to try to right. seek the same relief and we've in heard, going after dissidents. We've heard Mr. Cook say that. Yes. If this were a laptop, would the issues be the same, or are those more easily opened without having to uh, seek help from the manufacturer? Do you know? Well, you know, that's a good question. I. It may depend on what kind of operating system is being used. I would mm -hmm. imagine for tablets using uh, the same operating system, the same issues would sure. persist. For some computers that are running on older operating systems or different operating systems, uh, it may be easier for the maker of those systems to um, unlock the encryption or right. disable the features that would cause the material to uh, be destroyed. Look, I am no technician, I promise you that. But do you buy that if they unlocked this phone, just this phone, that somehow they have now uncovered some grand technology and the genie's out of the bottle, and as a result, we've done something that can't be put back in? Well, I, I, I don't think that's true of just this phone. In other words, they could uh, disable these two features on the phone. Right. Um, and the two features are one that uh, provides that if you entered the, the, the security right. number passcode more than 10 times right. incorrectly, it erases everything on the phone. Right. And the other is a software feature that introduces a time delay with every time you get it wrong, right. you have to wait longer and that prevents a mechanized, computer-driven uh, passcode operation. They could disable those features for this phone and then whatever soft core, software code they use to do that, they could destroy. So uh, in theory, they could do it as a one-off. Uh, in practice, if they demonstrate that they can do this, and they can, then other prosecutors around the country are gonna seek the same relief. Uh, and Apple can't very well say, we don't technologically have the capability because they've just shown they do. I would think they would now, forgive me, but. They do, they do, yes. they do. But I'll tell you, um, the other wrinkle here is, they're changing their operating system. Uh, so all the more speak. reason then, arguably, if they're changing their operating system, these phones won't be around anymore, so let's do it for this. Well, you certainly make that argument. They're, they're changing the operating system such that I think when the government asks for this relief the next time, they'll be able to say genuinely, we can't do it.
I want to speak about another legal matter, if I may, and that is our United States Supreme Court. Um, uh, tragically, uh, Justice Anthony and Scalia lost his life, um, suddenly unexpected, and we now have a vacancy on the court. There is tremendous contention on the U.S. Senate side about whether Mr. Obama should nominate, and if he does, what should happen to that nomination. As a student of the law of the Supreme Court, what do you make of this situation? I, I think he should absolutely nominate the best qualified candidate, uh, and the Senate ought to take it up, vet that candidate, and bring that candidate to a vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the candidate is qualified uh, and talented and would make a good justice, they should confirm him or her. Uh, I find it appalling that this is even a matter of debate, let alone that the GOP leadership has dug in and said, we're not even going to meet with them, we're not even going to have hearings on them. Uh, What's this... interesting about that, and I'm just an observer, is couldn't they have just whispered to each other, oh, we'll let him nominate, but we'll just vote no. I mean... Yeah, they could certainly do that, but I think they're, you know, they're catering to the same base that we see the GOP presidential candidates try to cater to, which is uh, archly conservative, vehemently anti-Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a wonderful editorial cartoon of the Constitution and the provision that talks about right. the president nominating, uh, and it said, the president, except Barack Obama, shall nominate, right. the Senate shall advise a consent. So, <laughs> you know, that they, they have such an antipathy towards the president that they're, I think, driving the Senate leadership to do this. They also want to make an issue in the presidential race. They think it helps turn out their base. Those are, are terrible reasons to ignore constitutional responsibility. It helps turn out the Democratic base? Uh, well, it, it will help turn out both. Uh, they think it is more advantageous to their base, uh, or they wouldn't be doing it. And there's nothing Mitch McConnell does without a political motivation. But I, I'll tell you, the problem is bigger than the Supreme Court, and this is an issue I've worked on for some years now. Uh, I co-chaired and co-founded the House Caucus on the Judiciary. Right. And one of the early issues we took up and we wrote to our Senate leadership counterparts is there's an enormous holdup of district court judges, of court right. of appeals judges. Uh, and I think, and, and we had a bipartisan support for this letter, that district court judges should be given 90 days to be vetted and then the Senate should vote on them up or down. Court of Appeals, maybe 180 days to vet. Supreme Court justices, you could say, you could pick a different period to vet. Uh, but then they ought to be entitled to an up or down vote. Does not mean they get confirmed? But it does mean that it comes to a, a conclusion in a responsible period of time. As we speak today, we don't see much slippage on the Republican side on this issue. A couple members, maybe Senator Kirk of Illinois, maybe Senator Collins of Maine, Jeb Bush said he would nominate. Do you think there could be a break here? I think, you know, it's unlikely given how dug in uh, Senator McConnell is, but I think it will become much more difficult once there's an actual nominee. Uh, if it's a, and what I would recommend to the President, frankly, is pick at someone who's on the Court of Appeals, who's recently been confirmed by an overwhelming margin. Right. Uh, and I could name a few. Oh, I there mean, are, there are. There are lots and what about of the judges. current Attorney General? Uh, what about uh, Sri Srinivasi, I think is how exactly. you say his name. I mean, he was just confirmed. And so one could argue there are people that seem palatable, no? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I want to thank you so much for joining us. His name is Adam Schiff. He is a member of the United States Congress. He is the ranking member on the House Intelligence Committee. Like me, he found his way to San Jose. We are at the California Democratic Party Convention. We thank you so much for joining us on Charter Local Edition.